we're about ready to get started. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining. I see a lot of new names, so I'm glad that everyone can make it out. This is the Finos Open Source Readiness Working Group meeting. Um, we hold this every two weeks on Wednesday at 10 a.m. Eastern. Um, if you'd like to be added to the recurring calendar invitation, please send me an email, aaron at finos.org. My name is Aaron Williamson. I am the uh, the lead of the Open Source Readiness Initiative at Finos. Uh, today, I'm really excited to have joining us Toby Langell. Tony, Toby is a uh, an open source analyst um, with a consultancy called Unlock Open. He was a presenter at the Finos Open Source Strategy Forum, um, and he's going to talk today about uh, about um, going from a uh, from an open source consumer to a strategic participant in uh, in open source uh, development. Uh, so Toby, I'll allow you to give a, a better and fuller introduction of yourself and, and take it away. Yeah, so the, the goal of today, um, well, first of all, is, is to make this as interactive as possible. So um, I do have some slides, I do have like you know, so some, some comments already, but if you, uh, please, please do feel free uh, to interrupt and ask questions. Um, so, you know, this is a particular focus on a particular um, area of, of open source um, um, and a particular benefit of open source, which is its ability to help companies recruit, retain, and foster top talent. Um, and so before we get into this, uh, yeah, um, Aaron did um, a good job of introducing me. Hello, my name is Toby Langell. Uh, I'm the founder and principal of Unlock Open, which is a boutique consulting firm uh, based in Geneva, Switzerland, but with clients all over the world. Um, I essentially help um, my clients with their open source strategy um, and their uh, standardization strategy. I, I do uh, sort of both. Um, and I operate um, from a, a wide variety of, of client size. Um, two of my current clients, which are I'm doing open source work for them, so so it's it's public. Um, one is um, the Google AMP project, uh, for which I helped uh, organize a, a governance model and move it to the OpenGS Foundation recently. And another one uh, that I've started advising really recently, which is probably a bit closer to home for you all, is uh, the Coil, um, which is a spinoff of Ripple that is. Um, uh, trying to make web monetization um, uh, something that um, a, a different monetization strategy for the web. So with that background, uh, let's get started. Um, first, I'd like to give a little bit of context as to exactly what we'll be looking in today, uh, which is basically like at this point, um, everyone knows how to consume uh, open source, right? This is a, a slide from the talk I gave at the um, Open Source uh, Strategy Forum in New York uh, late last year, and it's the, it's um, data from full financial uh, services. Sorry, <clears throat> sorry, Toby, just interrupting. Um, Aaron, I don't suppose you happen to have the deck because I'm I'm getting a white screen now, so I don't know if you could actually send the deck out. We could just refer to it. Oh, okay. okay. Um, Toby, if you'll send it to me, I'm happy to send it around. You know what I'm going to do? Yes, I just. Um, I just have to, to share it first. This is really strange. I'm, I'm sorry about this. It's, it's, right. weird. It's, actually, it's, it's, it's saying it's sharing your app, <laughs> but it's not actually there. So let, let's get a shareable link. Um, When was the link? Can view, save. So I'm going to get that link. Um, so Pop it in the chat, probably doing. Yeah. Oh, can I do that? I just I don't even know what a chat is on this thing. There's a little uh, icon at the bottom that's a, a speech bubble. Yes, I can see this. Full. 
Great. And I, I will download that as a, as a PDF and send it around for those who are not able to access Google Docs. Oh, there's that too. I hadn't, <laughs> I didn't think about that. Can you, can you do that, Aaron? No problem. But uh, please, please go ahead and continue. All right. So let me go back this and to the presentation. Um, so for those of you that, that are seeing the slide right now, this is a slide that shows that, um, you know, it, it's data that comes from um, uh, the um, Black Duck report um, that shows that basically 100% of the um, uh, projects that they audited in, in 2018 contained open source, and that's true for financial services as well as across the board. So we're not really interested about consuming open source now. This is like everyone does it, right? This is no longer a thing. Uh, what's more interesting, however, is looking at uh, how much um, you actually contribute to. And if you look at financial services, you see that um, um, companies, in, in um, according to the survey from open source programs in the enterprise, um, from the Linux Foundation and the new stack, um, about 29% of companies in um, financial services contribute to open source, only 10% of, of which uh, is often, right? If you contrast this to a tech, you'll see that tech is close to double that in terms of percentages, right? So this is really just to set the context, which is that we're going to be talking really about um, how to build a, a culture of contributing to open source, not a culture of using it. Right? So, um, and the goal is to build a, a strong open source culture and to leverage it to recruit, retain, and foster top talent. There is lots of different benefits to uh, building a strong uh, open source culture, but uh, we're really gonna focus on this today. Um, and to do that, we're gonna look at five different aspects. The first one is why do you, you know, why would you actually want to build a strong open source culture? Uh, the second one is why do developers actually care about this? Then we're going to look at what you can actually concretely do to improve your open source culture. Um, then we're going to look at how can you make it more visible because just improving it without making it more visible. Um, it doesn't yield obviously as much benefits and isn't as valuable, right? Um, and lastly, how can you actually leverage this visibility um, to um, basically get a return on your investment? And if we have time, uh, which and, and if there are volunteers, which would be great, um, what I'd really want to do is actually um, go through a couple of your web presences for the different companies that you present uh, in the browser just the way like a developer would actually look at um, um, you, you know, your presence to see um, whether like you're a compelling company to go work for uh, if they actually care about open source. So um, why should you care about building a strong open source culture? Uh, well, there's very compelling data uh, about this, uh, the, the key reason is basically that developers care, right? So this is a survey that I did in um, uh, 2016 uh, using Twitter. So it's obviously horribly biased because every Twitter survey is horribly biased, right? So it's like a total convenience sampling uh, method, but it did get quite a, quite a large uh, number of, of people voting over 2000, uh, considering like when I do surveys, usually I get 100 to 200 people voting. This, you know, really means that it's something that developers actually care about. It was like well retreated and lots of conversations around it. And the data out of this is basically 65%. So roughly two thirds um, believe that um, Contrib being able to contribute to open source software as part of your full-time job um, is somewhat important or extremely important, right? And under 20% actually think that it's not really something that they care about. So obviously, this is a biased sample, um, but it's, you know, it's a rather large number of, of, of voters um, and, and I do, uh, I'm, I'm quite part of the open source scene and the open source culture. Um, and so uh, people that actually follow me that have seen this, um, this um, survey are people that are, um, you know, 
also quite influential in that sphere and that uh, belong in lots of different open source projects. And so it's, it's probably the kind of developers uh, that you'd be interested to recruit. So, you know, the, that's, if you don't really have a strong open source culture, you're basically at least cutting away um, um, 1,500 of those. Um, there's a um, slightly more recent, again, Twitter survey that asks a similar question uh, in 2018 from uh, Corey House ran that survey. It's basically asking the same question and you see sort of a similar breakdown, right? Which says 25% believe it's it's critical. So in general, you have between a quarter and a third that are diehard open source fans, um, and that would literally not go work anywhere else. Um, then you have roughly half of the of of um, potential um, you know of developers that believe that this is important, but it's not the only criteria that they will look at, um, and so um, you know. This is, you'll see them uh, if they, for example, get two co competing offers, um, go for the one that has a stronger open source culture, right, out of those two. And then again, here you have roughly a fifth to a quarter, which don't really care about this. Um, and, you know, this begs the question, which is our sort of our like, second point, which is, well, why do developers actually care? Um, and obviously, um, you know, one of the key reasons that developers care is that today their GitHub profile is their resume, right? Um, and so uh, there's a lot of issues with this, right? I mean, uh, it's damaging to people and especially to uh, minorities um, that aren't able, that are uh, you know, not as privileged and cannot spend so much time working on open source, but it's nonetheless a reality, right? So this is something that's important to developers because if you think about it, when you recruit developers and when you uh, when you search for um, you know potential recruits, one of the key ways that you're going to do this is actually um, through looking at their open source contributions and their GitHub profiles. Right. So the the same way that it's it's hard to explain um, on the resume uh, two three years where you weren't you weren't doing anything. It's pretty hard to explain on, on um, to a potential recruiter on um, uh, your GitHub profile why you haven't been working in open source for the last two or three years, um, and it and brings up a ton of questions around uh, your knowledge of new technology. Uh, you know, are you familiar with the, the, the new toolings and new pro processes, etc. So that's one of the key reasons why it's important. The other reason is just as much as Companies, um, you know, look at GitHub's um, uh, profiles. Developers um, do the same when they get recruited, right? They go look at what your company's profile um, is, uh, looks like, whether it's on GitHub or whether you have a dedicated site for open source and engineering blog, et cetera, right? Um, and why do they do that? Well, because you know, first of all, well, they care about open source for the reasons uh, I explained just right above, but the, the other aspect is it's actually a window into a company's internal culture, right? Um, you see lots of, um, of, of, um, of flags, of red flags come up really quickly in how companies do open source that you can imagine now only worse um, internally. I just want to flip side. Um, Thirdly, um, not every tech job in the world is necessarily um, the most exciting or um, the most compelling um, um, job, right? Not everyone can build can work on um, you know consumer facing products that ship to billions of users. There's a lot of uh, a lot of work that needs to happen behind the scene. That isn't as glamorous, uh, but that you know it can still be interesting. And um, when and that's not the case, having a lot of open source related um, work, um, you know, related projects around this work, or that this work itself be in part open source, can bring you know can provide intrinsic motivation to the job that wouldn't necessarily have that otherwise. Um, 
Firstly, for people who really care about open source um, and who are part of this community, this is part of, you know, building a strong open source culture is part of this whole idea of bringing your own self to work, which is something that's increasingly more important to people. So the fact that they can continue uh, participating um, um, in the community and, and using the practices that they really like that comes from their open source background. Um, lastly, um, there is a sort of like a, a bring your own tools dimension to uh, companies that have a strong open source culture. Um, you know, this is this is something, for example, that um, uh, a company like Facebook talks a lot about when it talks about its open source culture. It, the fact that it's using React for pretty much um, all of its um, consumer facing products means that um, React developers that um, Facebook hires. Um, are just basically using the same set of tools that they were before. And once they leave Facebook to go work at a different company, uh, also on React, they will be using the same tools again. And so all of the, um, you know, the, the muscle memory, the, no, the know-how, the knowledge um, the, um, that, that they've built throughout their job translates to future jobs um, and also to um, their outside, out-of-work um, um, coding if and that's their thing. So that begs the question of how you can actually improve your open source culture. Um, checking the time here, I'm just wondering if uh, people have questions so far or if I should just go ahead and continue. Oh, if you're actually still hearing me. Okay. We hear you. Okay, okay. good. <laughs> just checking. Um, all right, so uh, let's continue with um, the third part of, of this um, uh, short presentation, which is how you can actually improve your open source culture. Um, and the first um, aspect here is that a lot of um, the times companies are really concerned about how they're perceived um, outside and their image. and Building an open source culture is actually doing a focus that's really on the individual first, on the people first, then on the communities, then on the projects, and only then on the companies, right? Um, and, and this uh, leads into, you know, small, small aspects um, uh, such as really paying attention to details. A, a, a thing that I see, you know, that I see all the time, so that's just an example, right? But it's like, you get this email, which is, you know, like tubland20 uh, at company.com, right? Uh, this seems like um, a trivial issue um, that shouldn't really bother anyone. Um, but this is the kind of thing that if you, you know, add a, a number of tiny aspects like this, A, shows a company culture that in general is really focused on, um, making it easy for administrators um, to maintain, you know, handle the company and really isn't uh, conducive to um, ac actual people um, within the company um, flourishing and, and, and being able to, to thrive uh, in an environment where they're, they're essential, like they're really uh, perceived as really valuable to the company. So this is obviously just an example, but it's re really quickly a case of dust by a thousand cut, right? Uh, where you'll see, um, for example, companies that um, um, require uh, developers to have their own GitHub account and a GitHub account for the company. Right? I mean, this obviously um, hurts their ability to showcase their um, what they do in open source. Uh, because they have now two distinct identities, and when they leave the company, uh, it's you know sometimes the, the old identity um, uh, disappears, and so it sort of defeats the purpose. Well, at least one of the purpose of really putting people, um, your employees, forward. Um, and and I, I'd like to quickly read a a quote on this topic from Tom Preston Warner, who is one of the co-founders of GitHub, uh, and he wrote this article I think in 2011. Um, where he really talks about the benefits of open source and uh, about um, 
open uh, you know developers and and, and acquiring and, and retaining developers he he says this let's face it great developers can take their pick of jobs right now so this is true now as it was in, in 2011 right these same developers know the value of coding in the open and will want to build up a portfolio of projects they can show off to their friends and potential future employers that's right a paradox in order to keep a killed developer happy you have to help them become more attractive to other employers but that's okay because that's exactly the kind of developer you want to have working for you so relax and let them work on open source or they'll go somewhere else where they can. Right? So there's this interesting tension here um, where by becoming more attractive to developers, you're also making your developers, uh, you know, to some degree more attractive to others, right? You, so it, it's, it's clearly a tension, but at the same time, um, you're also putting yourself in the position of a, a company that is more attractive to developers. Um, another important aspect of improving your open source culture is making your policies less of a hurdle. Uh, it's very often the case that um, open source policies are decided um, essentially by legal um, um, with the goal of protecting the company and the company's assets. And that's um, rarely conducive to um, policies that are uh, developer friendly. And, and it's often the case that developers uh, join a company, really excited about joining the company. And then once they have joined, they figure out that, well, they can no longer work on these open source projects that they used to be able to work on. Um, and, and that makes them um, sad, makes them want, want to leave and makes them consider other options. Um, I actually gave a talk about this called Open Source Contribution Policies That Don't Suck at the um, Open Source Summit um, in um, Edinburgh, uh, I think now two years ago. Um, I'd be happy to give that talk to you all at some point if you uh, if this is a topic of interest um, in like a, you know, a future call at some point. And if not, the slides um, are available. Unfortunately, it wasn't recorded. That's really like a very tactical set of principles um, to improve your policies and uh, really make it way easier for your developers to contribute um, to open source. Um, third point is actually make open source part of your whole engineering culture, right? Um, we have um, a, a large tendency in companies that are going through digital transformation of um, setting up, uh, you know, like an open source team or uh, an innovation lab or you know, really small areas where uh, hand-picked, um, 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 you know, top developers uh, get to work on cool stuff. That doesn't cut it, right? Because that, that's, that's, that's only gonna attract people to these particular roles. It's not gonna change your culture and it's not gonna make your company uh, more um, exciting for um, external, um, you know, for, for new recruits. It's going to make that particular innovation lab or that particular team, and that really um, um, is is not going to it's not going to get a, a great return on investment. So I talked a lot about this um, in a talk I, I gave at the Open Source Strategy Forum in London last year, which is basically align your open source um, culture, uh, align it with business goals, right? Uh, if it's if um, you just do an open source um, thing for the sake of it, um, and it's it it doesn't have uh, buy-in from executive executives, um, it, it it's not gonna get, it's not gonna get anywhere. Right, uh, it's going to it's going to get cut um, as soon as there's um, a little bit less funding for it, um, and you know if if it doesn't impact positively the company um, in ways that matters to its business goals, then really why bother? And so that basically means that you have to measure what you're doing. What you measure is going to be obviously dependent on what your business goals are, but you have to uh, make sure that you're going in the right direction. Uh, make sure that's impacting your business in the way you want it. Um, and for example, if the goal is just to, uh, uh, you know, uh, recruit more developers, 
find a way to measure that. And lastly, um, if you, know, you have to put um, really in, in um, make sure that you reward uh, the work that developers do when they work on open source. Because if you just tell them, yes, we're, we have an open source culture and we're an open source focused company, open source is great, um, but um, people don't get promotions for their work that they do in open source, uh, or that work is not recognized, it's not part of like the way, uh, you know, the OKRs or KPIs or whatever it is that you use to measure um, uh, folks in, in, in your company, um, it, it's obviously not gonna work, right? It really has to be recognized as something of value. Um, so having a good open, you know, a strong open source culture is one thing. Um, it, it, it's not enough. Um, uh, it's, it's not going to get the kind of return on you on investment that you would like it to, if it's not also, um, visible, right? And, um, if you look at, um, you know, if you put, Sort of open source culture, like the open source culture of a company on on you know two two axes, one where you have a weak open source culture going to a strong open source culture, um, on uh, the vertical axis, and on the horizontal one going from hidden to visible, um, you can actually place companies in there. Uh, it's quite an interesting um, uh, thing to do. Uh, for example, obviously a company like GitHub, which is uh, has a really strong open source culture and is obviously really visible about it, it's going to be in the top right quadrant. Uh, Microsoft and Facebook, uh, also in that quadrant, but uh, you know, so, sort of like more centered. Um, Amazon um, uh, actually has a strong open source culture, co contributes a lot to open source, but does a terrible job of making it visible for a, a whole set of different reasons. Um, and so ends up in the top uh, left quadrant. And a company of like Oracle, for example, which is, um, you know, doesn't have a uh, an open source culture at all uh, obviously doesn't hide it. I mean, it's you know obviously hidden uh, because well, there's nothing to show. Um, you rarely find companies um, that are uh, you know that both have a weak open source culture but are visible about it. And I also didn't want to really embarrass anyone outside of Oracle. Um, and so um, yeah, so you know th this is um, uh, a good way of of looking at um, you know of, of where you stand, right? And you can think about, well, you know, where would my company be in there? Um, and you really see then uh, two kind of movements, right? You can move from um, uh, Oracle's position to Amazon's basically, which is move from a weak uh, open source culture to a strong one. And then you can move from Amazon's position to sort of like Microsoft's, right? Which is incidentally what Microsoft has done over the last sort of decade, right? is moved from, um, uh, you know, a, a hidden and weak position to a strong and visible one. Um, and if we, you know, we talked about recruiting, retaining, and fostering talent. Um, and so uh, if if we look at this in um, this, uh, this uh, quadrant again, we see obviously that a strong and visible open source culture is conducive um, to um, really good recruiting. A strong and hidden one isn't going to help you with recruiting at all. Obviously, in a weak and hidden one isn't either. Um, what's you know sort of like a paradox is if you have a weak open source culture, but you're smart about the way you show it, you can actually um, um, you know it can actually really help your recruiting effort. But it won't last long, obviously, right? Um, um, the developers that you've recruited will soon find out that um, you know your old form and not function. Um, and retaining uh, developers will start um, being more difficult. Uh, on the contrary, um, a company like Amazon, um, which is both, um, you know, which is, has a strong open source culture, um, but isn't very, isn't very vocal about it, um, will find it um, makes it really easy for them to retain uh, developers. Toby. Yes. I'm here. Can I give a real life example of exactly that? Oh, I'd love it. Okay, so I, uh, one of my customers, I am not gonna name them. They're a Swiss company. They have really nice salaries. Uh, they just lost a developer. 
he wanted to contribute to Wikipedia, which they're using internally. Unfortunately, they have a policy that says no contributing to open source projects that are being used internally because of a risk of conflict of interest, which we all know here that's this total bull. But anyway, that's their policy. So he couldn't. What did he do? He left. He left a very nice salary in a Swiss company and joined a nonprofit. Well, there you go. Yeah. Real well, life. I mean, yeah. I mean, last year. Um, it, it, I, I have uh, funny examples actually in the uh, financial industry of developers um, going around policies like this by by doing the contributions that would be useful for their work on their own time uh, uh, in the evening because they actually did need that to work for their work, right? So the They're whole policy, a risk there if they if they if it gets found out. Well, ab well, absolutely. Not only are they take, taking a risk, but like the, the protection for the company itself, um, uh, you know, that's that also creates a risk for the company, right? Obviously, that's not a, a right thing to do, but that's the kind of thing that happens when you have policies that are um, not adequate um, with um, the kind of practices that developers actually need uh, to get their job done. Exactly. Um, and lastly, if you add um, actually fostering talent, right? Because retaining it is good. Fostering is obviously better uh, because it turns um, junior developers into senior developers. Um, and open source is actually extremely good for that. And there's um, a lot of research on that topic um, that, that shows that uh, you know, teams that contribute to open source um, actually improve and in, in, um, uh, Individuals in those teams improve, and teams them, themselves improve and are, uh, have increased efficiencies to a, quite a, a large amount. And so, um, obviously, if you have a strong open source culture, whether that culture is visible or not, it will um, help foster your developers. So, how can you make it more visible? Well, there's a number of things that you can do, which is they're, they're all actually quite simple to do, but very few companies do them. Um, uh, one is to have a strong uh, a GitHub presence. Uh, another important one is to have a dedicated website. Some companies even have also a company at github.io because a lot of developers go check that. Um, you know, a bit more involved, um, but again, really effective for recruiting. Um, purposes as an engineering blog, especially when we talk about uh, open, the open source projects that you um, contribute to or that you've actually contributed to the community. Uh, funding dependencies um, is, for, is for, yes? Nope. Oh, I thought someone was raising their hand. I can't see you because if not, you can, I cannot present full screen, so. Um, so funding dependencies is actually a really um, interesting one. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with opencollective.org, um, it's a, a small company that makes it really easy for companies um, to sponsor um, the projects that they rely on for their work. Um, and uh, that is actually extremely effective uh, to first of all get the kind of work that need that you need um, implemented, but then also from a visibility perspective, um, there's an example that I really like to talk about, which is the um, uh, company, the um, sort of like hotel booking, a travel booking company called uh, Trivago, which is um, a European company. Um, uh, a few years ago, they were relying on Webpack quite a bit uh, for all of their their front end uh, work. And they wanted a number of improvements in Webpack that they didn't really have the time to do. And so they gave about 100,000 US dollars to the project for a year um, to uh, sponsor that work that they were really, that they were basically keen to have um, for their own website. And so they did that. And after a year, they were like really happy with the outcome uh, because that work had been funded. Um, and you know, if, if you actually just think about how much they spent on that compared to the kind of work that they got out of it um, and the, the quality of the engineer that worked on it, which was basically the maintainer of the Webpack project, uh, you see that that was, you know, um, like um, a great value for the money, right? They probably would have spent two, three, four times that amount 
had they hired for, for a specific role uh, to work on that. And uh, it would have been a lot more difficult for uh, that person to actually get those changes implemented in the project. So it was, you know, absolutely amazing for this. But there was an interesting side effect was because they started funding that project, they became very visible to open source developers in Europe. And they had lots of JavaScript developers just come bang on their door and say, you have a job for me. Like, you seem like a cool company. You fund open source. I want to work for you. And out of that, I think the first year they funded, uh, they hired four JavaScript developers. Um, and they really came sort of like the European company to go work for so were JavaScript developers. And so they continued investing in that. And I think like last year, they actually launched a small open source conference at their office. And so they really, um, you know, saw the benefits of leveraging the open source work that they were doing, both from an operational perspective where they actually had the code that they needed built for them, but also from a promotional perspective. Um, and then, um, uh, you know, tying to that, actually having your engineers speak at conferences, talk about the, the open source projects that they're working on, and also sponsoring some conferences, uh, especially small ones, small community conferences, which are generally cheap to, to fund, um, um, is um, really, um, effective thing. Lastly, uh, the question is, how can you actually leverage um, that extra visibility you've done? Yeah, and this is the typical sort of brand versus response marketing um, 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 question. Um, so for those of you that are not familiar with those marketing branding, uh, marketing uh, terminology, brand is really when you focus on uh, improving the perception of your brand as a whole. Um, and you don't really, you don't really, you don't, you know, have call, calls to actions or any of that. You don't really expect a direct, immediate outcome for what you do. And then uh, response marketing is sort of, um, uh, you know, the really like call to action. Now do this um, uh, uh, type of marketing, right? So which one you focus on is going to depend a lot on the circumstances um, and where you're at. For example, if you look at GitHub's online presence in terms of open source. Um, it doesn't have to do a lot. Like everyone knows that GitHub is a huge open source company. Um, so they, you know, they're so strong on brand that they don't really have to showcase what they do. On the other hand, you'll find companies that are um, not so strong on their open source brand. And, um, uh, you know, they can have calls to actions if they have an open, if you have like an open source uh, page, you can have calls to actions in there. They're like, well, if you're, you know, if you're actually here to work on, you're interested in those, these like machine learning projects, it turns out we have these five machine learning positions that are open. Um, and so you can, um, uh, you know, you can funnel them into your recruiting uh, funnel, right? Um, and then the other thing you can do is also for developers, for engineers that are in your marketing funnel when they talk to, sorry, in your recruiting funnel when they talk to your recruiters, as also uh, showcase sort of like the open source work that you do. So it, it, it goes on both sides. Um, so we're going to have time for the hot seat and for questions. So let me uh, start with um, opening the floor for questions first. So just to, just to confirm, it's spot on, yeah? I think we're all going to echo with this, but um, just echoing thoughts that we're, we're all struggling with in the company, it's really nice to see. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know if you got cut or if that was just a really short statement. It's just a statement, yeah. Just, okay. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, are there other comments, questions? Do, do you actually have challenges with actual examples where people really have seen IP issues or bank data or other, you know, private information being sent out through into, you know, through open source when inadvertent by accident or not? Well, I mean, there was a, um, it, it was a while back, a search that you can, you could do on GitHub. Now GitHub has actually done work to prevent that. 
um, not only in the search, but to actually alert um, um, open, you know, projects that had this issue. Well, you could basically just look for, um, you know, keys to like S3 um, instances or things like that that were just um, part of config files that had been contributed to open source projects. So, yes, obviously, um, obviously security concerns are, are, are very real, right? Um, but as I was saying before, um, it, it's not because you don't do open source at all um, that um, those concerns are going to go away. Uh, I just, if you give me a second, I'm uh, just going to try to stop sharing the browser. So you, oh, here it is. You can actually see me. Um, so uh, people contribute to open source regardless. You know, this is the typical... Um, a bring your own device at work um, uh, issue. Um, a while ago, um, it was impossible. You know, when the iPhone came out, it was basically impossible to bring an iPhone to work, and people still did it, right? Um, and found lots of ways around it. And at some point, uh, IT departments and companies had to come to the conclusion that people weren't going to do this, and they were better off actually being. Uh, in charge of it than having all of that happen uh, in their backs and not knowing who was accessing what on which device, right? And for open source, it's a very similar problem. It's like, this stuff happens, you can either build trust between engineering and legal in a way that um, engineering understands the concerns that legal and compliance, et cetera, have, right? Or you can not do that um, and, and just have people find workarounds. So I, I don't think that you can just get rid of the security question um, uh, by deciding that your company doesn't do open source. I agree. Yeah. I do have one other example there. And, and again, I think it's a little bit of a red herring because ultimately it had nothing to do with the, the bank's open source practices, but there was an instance, it was, a, it was actually a federal lawsuit as well um uh basically a goldman sachs developer who wanted to uh take some software he had worked on internally and use it in his next job um you know quote unquote quote open sourced that software independently through his own github account by sort of sneaking the code out of the bank and and publishing it on github under an open source license which he obviously didn't have authority to do uh and then you know, and then sort of leaving the company and going from there. Um, again, you know, that, that's not something that you can prevent by, by locking down your open source policies. It's, it's, it, it's something that, you know, that developer was, you know, maybe unhappy that that wasn't something that had been open sourced at, at Goldman Sachs and, and took matters into his own hands. Right. You, you probably increased the risk in that particular case by... Um, not having uh, built uh, a, a good relationship between um, legal and engineering, right? Or this was like a one-off, uh, someone's basically stealing stuff. Um, no, another, so I don't want to dominate. I've got another question if no one else is coming in. Sure. So one of the challenges we're seeing is that we're actually, I'm Simon Holt from uh, JP Morgan. So we actually developed a, fa a fairly robust process now to get people contributing, um, got buy-in from compliance and legal and social media policies, et cetera, which is great. One of the challenges I've now got is recognizing, therefore, the extra controls we should have. And one of those, which I see this issue, and I'm putting it to the floor to see whether others do, is trusted developers and malware. So where someone can integrate, like this happened in N NPM uh, last year, when someone integrates the community, becomes a trusted member, and then actually their whole purpose is six months down the line to inject and ex have accepted pull requests with malware involved. Then in that situation, having the provenance and be able to track through your build and your deployment to be able to rapidly find that malware um, and actually fix it. And it's a real challenge to get people to take their head out of the sand. Yeah, so that, I mean, I agree. Um, uh, there is, um, 
There were lots of security concerns. Um, was the amount of dependencies that we're relying on today and open source dependencies. Um, but that's sort of orthogonal really to um, contributing to open source. This is really a an issue about um, uh, using it and using it in a secure way. Um, and, I, and I think this is an industry-wide problem and concern right now. Um, and obviously there needs to be a, a lot more work in this area. Um, but to be very honest, it's also like not my area of expertise. Um, I, I'd be happy to point you um, to a few companies that are looking at this problem, if that's uh, something you um, want to look into more deeply. Yeah, definitely interested. I, I mean, from my, my view, which I think echoes yours, is this is evolving. It will be a problem, and we will have to resolve it, and we can't hide from it. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Uh, I mean, this, 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 is, this, this won't be a problem. This is a problem. Um, uh, I mean, clearly, um, Im improving um, the security aspects of open source code um, especially was, uh, you know, the huge dependency trees that, uh, um, you know, some languages like JavaScript have today. Um, it's it's really, uh, you know, it, it, it got really easy to, to do something bad if you wanted to. Um, that said, I actually believe that having a strong open source culture and a strong, uh, contrib you know, being present in the community uh, can probably, um, um, make you more aware of what's going on in these areas more quickly. And so I, I think that that, um, uh, you know, again, like keep your enemies close, right? Um, both in terms of like making sure that your developers, uh, you know, are really able to contribute to, that you control what they do, make sure that you have a friendly relationship with them uh, so that they don't accidentally contribute stuff that, uh, you know, would create security problems or would create, um, uh, you know, competitive problems uh, um, or like value, losing value uh, assets or that kind of stuff. Um, and the same for security, if you're really embedded in these, in these open source communities, the, the, the projects of which you consume, you consume, you're going to see uh, when, um, you know, pull requests are accepted, like, um, really easily from um, contributors that you don't know well, or that, are, you know, just newly part of the community. Um, you're going to see these practices and you're going to be able to influence them. So if you actually care about security uh, of the open source um, um, software that you consume, the more embedded you are in their development, the safer you will be. Then, does anybody know of whether GitHub or well, rather Microsoft are looking into a scoring system like eBay? So you can actually, if someone is bad, mind you saying that, you just set up a new account, wouldn't you? But at least you can then see long-term trusted contributors versus people who are new. Um, but that's what you arguably you just go and check their history, don't you, like you were saying with recruitment? Yeah, so there's definitely um, a, a lot of interest and a lot of um, work going on um, in that space. I don't think we're going to have uh, something look like this because um, it, that would be very complicated for GitHub to implement something uh, that is both, um, uh, you know, like users are GitHub's, uh, are paying for GitHub accounts, right? So it's, it probably would be complicated to, to do that that way. That said, they block um, and remove um, um, accounts like on a very regular basis. Thanks, very interesting. We have uh, under five minutes left. Um, my uh, my hope was to be able to have a few of you volunteers so we could actually check your web, um, you know, your web, the web presence of the company you represent. Um, if this is something that it's probably something that takes a bit more than five minutes, so maybe if some, some of, you of you are really are... interested about this, um, I'd be happy to set like um, one on one calls with a few of you if this is something that we, you want to talk about um, and see uh, what, um, you know, how a developer, because uh, I have a developer background myself. Now it's, it's, it's sort of, you know, a, a while back, but, uh, you know, I still have a good sense of what developers are looking for. Um, and so if that's something you're um, um, interested in, I'd be, I'd be happy to, um, you know, set up a few calls. Um, uh, so I guess Aaron has my email address. And if, if some of you just want to do that, you can reach out to him and, and, and he'll make uh, intros. 
Absolutely, happy to do that, and I appreciate that offer. Um, does anyone else have any questions before we wrap up the call? Comments of point two. All right, a shy group today. Um, well, in that case, um, I want to give a hearty thank you to Toby for this really interesting presentation. Um, we'd love to have you back sometime to present again. Um, everyone else, um, just as a reminder, this, um, this meeting uh, occurs every two weeks at the same time, 10 a.m. Eastern on Wednesdays. Uh, the next presentation will be uh, by Ibrahim Haddad of the Linux Foundation. Uh, so I encourage you to come back in a couple of weeks. Toby, it's been great having you, and thanks so much. Thank you so much, and well, I hope to see you some other time. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you.